So I'm going to get some water or Handouts, got flyers, got everything going on today. So, uh, subject that I take uh, seriously, so I want to make sure I provide as much information as I can to you all. Assalamu alaikum. We start off with uh, Bismillah, Rahman Rahim, the name of Allah, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Anything that I say of the truth conveyed today is from Allah as a wajil, and the error that I make is my own. <clears throat> so the topic that I've been uh, advertising somewhat in the last couple of days and last week or so has been on Adam, alayhi salam, Cleopatra, and Muhammad, so the lehi was seven. Hold on one second. I have some issues. Oh, no, don't worry about this one. This is in the uh, news. <clears throat> so, again, the uh, topic was Adam, alayhi salam, Cleopatra, and Muhammad, so the lehi was seven. And I want to start off. First, with my own personal experience, and I'm sure you all probably have experienced this yourselves, is that I am a brown skin man. When the uh, sun comes out in the summer, my skin gets darker. In the winter, when the sun is out less, and, uh, there's more less sunshine, I get a little paler. Now multiply that by a thousand years in different climates and different time periods, and you will kind of get the gist of what I will be saying here today. <clears throat> There's an anthropologist named Nina Gablonski. She says, there is a conspicuous geographical pattern between skin color and distance from the equator. At more northern and so southern latitudes, so at the top of the uh, planet, at the bottom of the planet, the level of UVB rays hits the Earth's surface decreased due to the, the planet's tilt. So the planet is tilting closer towards the sun, and the equator is closest to it because the Earth is round. Now, if you are one of those people that say the Earth is flat, then we got a whole other argument. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm, we'll deal with you on a different time. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Earth is round, and it's tilting towards the sun. She also says the equator is bathed year-round with UVB rays. But seasonal variations mean that the people in the nor northern Europe receive virtually no UVB exposure in the winter. Now, I wanted, uh, I figured this talk would be pretty extensive, so I wanted to make sure I brought some visuals. Um, hopefully everybody sees this, and I'm going to pass these things around so everybody sees it. So this is uh, indicative of the sun. This is the uh, top of the sun. This is from the top of the earth, north and south. Now, this is the equator right here, which is closest to the sun, so it gets more exposure. These get less exposure. All right, I just want to I'm giving a handout, so I'll, I'll be, you can just pass it around to everyone else. I'll be doing this the whole time. <clears throat> As a result of this, she says, humans live, living near the equator develop darker skin tones, while those in north uh, have lighter hues. Now, what I also wanted to give you a picture of was the UV rays, how it is hitting the Earth. And in the middle here is where the equator is. And you'll see that the UV rays strike more extensively, intensively in the middle. And then on the north and south is lighter. And the bottom part of this picture, I want to make sure that this is shown as well. The bottom part is indicative of people's skin color. In Africa and South America, 
in Australia, in India, down here, in Saudi in Arabia, in Yemen. These people are dark brown and black people. And then the lighter you get up, I mean the higher you get up, the lighter they are, the lower you go down, the lighter they are. Alright? <clears throat> Scientists say human beings came from Africa, probably East Africa, Ethiopia. What's up, brother? You know what I'm talking about here, right? <laughs> we didn't discuss this, right? The father of us all is called Adam, right? I know this is something that everyone knows, but it's, it's important because even uh, I learned something more just in uh, discussing this. I'll let you see that. It's called Adam in the... Abrahamic traditions. <clears throat> and here is a picture of what, yes? According to the Bible and those that wrote that, that was blank, blank, how many thousand years ago? Right, right. We're going to get to it. We're going to get to it, brother. <laughs> In the picture, all right, here's a picture of Adam according to National Geographic. Now, let me, before I send it to you, I want to make sure you understand that we don't have depictions of our prophets and messengers. This is what National Geogra Geographic said he would probably look like, right? And I had pictures on social media of a uh, European person that they had uh, depicting to us as Adam since I was born. This is what National Geographic said he would look like. With a wide nose, wide lips, dark skin, dark complexion, dark hair, coming from Eastern Africa. All right, so this is what they said, their composition of what he may look like. <clears throat> In the Quranic dictionary, the word Adam means to reconcile. It means to be brown. It means human skin. It means human being. It means a person, an intelligent person. It also means brown and I say dark brown because there's another word for brown in Arabic. It's called asmar, which is light brown. So Adam was dark brown because of his, his proximity to the sun. I said dark, uh, dark skin, or dark brown, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the Quran also says that he was made from black clay, hamain, black mud. In the Quran, Surah 15, Ayah 26, it is translated, and certainly we created man of clay that gives, gives forth sound, of black mud fashioned into shape. Now I showed you a picture of what Adam may have looked like. This is probably the complexion of Eve. And this is the translation of the, of the ayah that I read. And I wrote beside it the, um, the verse of the Quran. Now some of these pictures are cut short, so I had to write it on the side. <clears throat> this black mud speaks to his complexion, what complexion he would look like. Now, on to Noah, and we talked about him a couple weeks ago, or last week, Noah had three sons. Scholars say that he is the father of the Negroid, the Mongoloid, and the Caucasoid people. Of all people came from Noah, right? I want to write this down as well. <clears throat> so from Noah, came Ham, Shem, and Japheth. <clears throat> He's a Negroid. I hate that word Negroid, man. I, I'm going to tell y'all something about that in, in a moment. Um, start on this right. Something like that. When I um, at my previous job, they asked for my birth certificate, and under race, it put it said Negro, 
And my HR director is younger than me. He was like, how old are you? <laughs> Why does it say black or African American? It said Negro in it. He was like, well, you were born in the civil rights time. <laughs> but anyway, so I always had a, a, a negative uh, vibe towards the word Negro. I don't know why. Um, always, even more so than the N-word. I thought it was like, when people said Negro, I thought they were wanting to say the N-word to me, and they didn't say it, so I didn't like that word. Yes. Is that on your birth certificate? On my birth certificate. What state? In Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> right, right. That's weird. Very weird. So, Ham uh, was the son of Noah, and he's black. He's considered to be the father of the Negro race, so he's black. As the father of the Negro race, he, all of his sons were also black. Let me write down the names of his sons because they are important as well. Canaan, Cush, <coughs> Mizram, and Put. Now these are very important names. <coughs> <clears throat> Canaan was the ancestor of the tribe of the original inhabitants of Canaan. The territory, which is roughly the area that is Israel or Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. Right? So before the children of Israel came into existence, there was a people called Canaan, the Canaanites. They lived in this land. The and the children of Israel, according to the Bible, came and killed them and took their land. But they were black and brown people, right? Orig originally. And Cush means the kingdom of Cush. And uh, it is identified in the Bible as Ethiopia and Arabia. Hear me, hear me? Ethiopia and Arabia. So also on this is Eritrea, part of Sudan, and, Som and Somalia, right? <clears throat> Let me see you, show you a picture. Again, it's cut off a little bit, but you will see the Kushite people are, this is Egypt right here. This is Kush or Ethiopia. On this side right here is Eritrea. You'll also see Sheba at the bottom of here, Ooh. right? Queen of Sheba is a part of, of the Kushites. And this is Arabia, <clears throat> right? And then between them is the Red Sea. And that was supposed to be what year? Huh? And what year was? This was about 4,000 years ago. About 4,000 years ago, approximately 5,000 years ago, the Kushite people had migrated to what is northern India. Right. They were known as the Dravidians. Right. I, I, I'm going to get to it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We got, it, we got it there here. I know you know for sure, right? So, Kush, Kush means land of burnt face people, right? So, if we include, include the Dravidians, we include the uh, obviously the Ethiopians. No, that's never in dispute. The uh, you go <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Eritrea, obviously, Arabia, Yemen, which was Sheba, were all land of the burnt face people, mm -hmm. right? Put is also a place in ancient Libya. Put was called Punt, and it was an ancient land that used to trade with the ancient Egyptians. Egypt, Egyptians called the land <clears throat> ta -net -jer, meaning the land of God, speaking to its monotheism. Now, we have been told that Egypt was the first monotheistic religion. And they said they worship the sun, but these people worship God alone. And there is another whole nother discussion about all ancient people, all indigenous people were monotheists originally, before Egyptians. Egypt, Egyptians got their culture from Sudan. So, and that's where they get the pyramids from. That's why smaller pyramids in Sudan and larger pyramids in Egypt, they expanded upon what they learned previously. But at any rate, they were, they were monotheists. Mizra, Mizraim, is the Hebrew and Aramaic name for the land of Egypt. Kemet was originally the name that the, uh, the original, original inhabitants called the place. And Kemet means land of the blacks. Right? I mean, this stuff is, I mean, they wrote it out for us plain and simple. This is the land of black people. Right? In fact, 
Egypt comes from a, a Greek word that means black. So not only the people living there, but people, foreign people came and called this land, land of the black people. So they were black, right? The Bible refers to Egypt as the land of Ham. <clears throat> Did I put, yeah, I put Ham in there. So and it, it get, I can give you references to all of these things, right? Because they were black. You will also notice that the land that is currently occupied by Arabs and Israelis were originally land of black people, right? And I have a, a picture for that as well. Um, so I said Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, all of those are already known, but right here is where Israel is. I just put a little star right, a little arrow right here. Syria, uh, which is Saudi Arabia, what, what is Saudi Arabia now is on this, Yemen, Oman, all of this, right? And you'll also see that they're right across from there, in the middle of it, is the Red Sea. All of these were considered together. They weren't separate, like we separate them today, say they're in Africa, one is in Africa, and one is Asia. <clears throat> Apparently, there is some controversy about the complexion of the people in a country in the continent of Africa, the hottest continent on Earth, right? I mean, we should be, we are seemingly, hopefully, um, shedding the light on this, or shedding the lies on this, uh, idea that Egypt was anything other than dark black. The same thing is true of Arabia, we are beginning to see. This is perhaps because with Egypt there are all these accomplishments that the Egyptians have uh, had and people want to attach themselves to them. I'll give you a list of some uh, experts who've spoken on the matter who also attest to this fact despite the fact that the people living there called the place the land of the black and the people who came there called it the land of the black. Sir Richard Francis Bertram says, <clears throat> you are right, you are quite right about Af the African origin of the Egyptians. I have over a hundred skulls to prove it. Another scientist named R.T. Pritchard says, in their complexion and many of the complexions and in the physical peculiarities, the, e e the Egyptians, I'm sorry, were an African race. Um, the Greek historian Herodotus says the Egyptians face to, I saw the Egyptians face to face and they had black skin with woolly hair. He said many of, uh, many of the people of Egypt and mostly are uh, brown or black skin with skinny faces. Another anthropologist says the, Egypt, the ancient Egyptians were true Negro, Negroes of the same type as all native Africans. That being said, we can see how their blood mixed for several centuries with that of the Romans and the Greeks. It'll be, this will come up later. Most have lost the intensity of its original color while retaining nonetheless the imprint of its original mold. We can even state as a general principle that the face, meaning the face of the Sphinx, is a kind of monument able in many cases to attest to or share the light of historical evidence of the original people. He also says, he was, this, the, this person who says this was Constantine um, Francesco uh, del Volni. He was a French philosopher, he was an abolitionist and a writer, and he said, what a subject for meditation. Just think that the race of black people today are our slaves and the subject of our scorn is the very race that we owe our arts, sciences, and even the use of speech. So, Ham and all of his brothers, Ham and all of his sons were black. From this fact, we can deduce other facts. If Ham was black, and black enough to have all the people in Ethiopia, in Egypt, in Arabia, in Yemen to be black, then his father, Noah, must have been black also, right? <clears throat> a black child has black parents. So certainly he did not look like this. Russell Crowe, who played Noah in a picture, and I'm mentioning these things because they are of importance. Not only is Noah on here, his whole family is on here as European. 
So let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, where does uh, uh, Shem and Japheth fit into that blackness of no? It's coming to me. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one is a mongoloid and one is a. Uh, yes, sir. I got you. I got you. I got you. <clears throat> it's coming soon. So, <clears throat> the Bible says the entire world was destroyed by the flood. So that means Russell Crowe and his family repopulated the entire earth, the people who look like them, which is highly, highly unlikely. <clears throat> so if Noah was black, then all of his children were black, his daughters and sons. This reasoning extends all the way back to Adam and Eve, our original parents, as they too were black and brown. Black and brown. Not to mention that our, the birthplace of Adam Salam, and Eve is in Africa. And when I mention Africa, I mean Africa in the context of what they call the Middle East as well as a part of Africa. The Bible places the Garden of Eden in the proximity of Ethiopia in Genesis 2.13. They, a geneticist named Jen Lee found that our, all of our ancestry, everybody on this planet, is in Eastern Africa. And he did this despite the fact of believing he himself was Chinese, that he thought that he came from a different race of people. And he went out to test and prove this because the Chinese people or the people that he was in association with believed that they came from someone different than everywhere else. Like they were special, but he found out they were just the same. Any issue? Thank you. <laughs> it is quite impossible for no, for Russell Crowe looking uh, Russell Crowe and to be born in Ethiopia and to produce all the people that's on this earth. See, the Ethiopian skin complexion was so distinct that it's compared to leopard skin in the Bible. In Jeremiah 13:23, it says, "Can we?" Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard change his spots? That's how dark the Ethiopians were. Now, Jephthah is considered to be the progenitor or the ancestor of, of the European and some Asian people. And Shem is the progenitor of the Arabs, the Hebrews, the Midianites, the Syriac, uh, Syriac Aramans, uh, the Samaritans, and the Assyrians. We, we must bear in mind that both. Shem and Japheth were black. Noah, alayhi salam, was their father who was black. So they had to be black or brown themselves. That they are the foreparents of Europeans, Asians, and, and Arabs does not negate this fact. It reinforces the fact that the dominant gene can produce recessive traits and environment, climate, and diet play a significant role in our appearance. As I mentioned earlier, Assalamualaikum. We must not think of people of today as the original inhabitants of the land that they currently reside on. The first people were Africans, and they all migrated all over the world. Thus, the first European, though they were not given this name, were black or brown. The first Japanese was black or brown. The first Arab was black or brown. The first American was black or brown. The first French person was black or brown. And their religious figures were also black and brown. Godfrey Higgins was an, uh, was an English magistrate and a lawmaker and a, and a social reformer and a historian. He says in his book that the Jews of Jacob and Israel were Ethiopians. There seems to be nothing improbable in these Ethiopians being the tribe of Jews, the tribe of Jacob and Israel. Now we also know recent in recent history of Ethiopians saying that they were from the, the line of Jacob and the line of Israel and they went to Israel and it was proven to be the case. Now what we must must think is why are these dark-skinned Ethiopians and the, uh, the fair-skinned Jews in, uh, in Israel or Palestine, are they still from the same ch children? How does that happen? Right? But the Bible says that God sees children of Israel as the children of Ethiopia. In Amos 9, 7, it says, Are they not as children of Ethiopia unto me, O children of Israel? He used the, the terms interchangeably. Ethiopia, called them Ethiopians, who are the children of Israel. 
Now, further in his book, uh, in um, Godfrey Hing Hing Higgins' book, he says, from India, our black Buddhist at or about the same time was in Syria. He is suggesting that Buddha himself was black. The religion of Buddha of India is well known to have been very ancient. In the ancient temples scattered through Asia, his worship has yet, has yet continued. He is found jet black with a flat face, thin, thick lips, and curly hair of the African, is what he says. African historian Sheikh Anto Diab also shares this same sentiment. He says the Buddha was an Egyptian priest. He said this occurred during 525 to 522 of the, of the before the Common Era during the Persian conquest of Egypt. Now I think I've mentioned this already. The Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans conquered Egypt, which will give you some insight to why they are the complexion that they are currently. Sheikh Antioch also continues and says this tradition would justify the portrayal of Buddha with woolly hair. Another African scholar named Mubuhu, in his book Manifestation in Buddha, of Buddha in Asia, says that the Buddha had woolly skin, woolly skin and he had, he had black skin and woolly hair. I'm sorry. They all appear to be the Egyptian Nubian priests who fled Egypt. Gerald Macy writes, it is certain that the black Buddha of India was imaged as a Africoid type. Godfrey also says that all the Greek gods and goddesses of Greece were also black. And he also mentions Krishna. In the Indian language, it signifies black skin. I'm going to give you all a picture here of someone, uh, Senegalese model. Right? If you notice her skin, it's very dark skin. Um, the word Krishna means black, it means dark, it means dark blue, and it means all attractive. We've all heard the term blue-black. You can see a tint of blue on this lady with her dark skin. Right? So Krishna was also black. But back to Noah. From his son Shem, eventually we get what is called Tihra. That's the father of Abraham, alayhi salam. As we found Noah and Shem were black or brown, so too was Abraham. He and Sarah, which according to the Bible is his half-sister, which means she too was black. They had the same father. They have Isaac, which means he also was black or brown. Let me provide you some points of reference here. This right here is Egypt. This is the Red Sea. This right here is where Israel or Palestine is currently. And as you see, they are connected, physically connected. Right? <clears throat> That's why you have all these traveling of Moses to Egypt, of Joseph to Egypt, of Jesus to Egypt, because they were all, they all were in the same place. <laughs> Israel or Palestine was literally connected to Africa because it is Africa. Right below it is Egypt. There was so much travel because they were beside one another. And sometimes when we read these stories, we need to have a depiction. That's the reason why I put this picture out for you. I, I printed these things for you. Uh, I lost ink in my printer because I was printing all this stuff, uh, but I thought it was important. So you see, we have been fooled into believing there's a such thing as the Middle East. It is all Africa, all of it is connected. We have another picture just to show you the same thing. I think I'm going to be done with pictures for a little bit. But it's showing the same thing. It's all connected. <clears throat> the man made Suez Canal separated the land masses and maps that colonizers made is what they said is Africa, and they said this part is Asia. And we have no reason to accept this, none at all. All of the people there are close to the equator, so they are black or brown. Isaac was black, mainly because he was born in this region about 4,000 years ago, but also because he had a son named Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons. One of them was Joseph, or Yusuf, Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. 
And I just gave you all this documentation that Egypt is black, right? And we find that Joseph or Yusuf must have also been black. He eventually was raised into a high position. His own brothers came to visit him to ask for provision, ask for food. They did not recognize their own brother because he looked just like them. He looked just like the Egyptians, which means all of the children of Israel looked like the Egyptians, and so did their father Isaac, alayhi salam, and his mother and father Abraham and Sarah. And according to the Bible, Abraham, alayhi salam, was the father of the Midianites, with a woman named Keturah as their mother. We find that Moses, or Musa, alayhi salam, his father-in-law, Jeth, um, Jethro, was a Midianite, meaning Abraham was his forefather. Thus, Jethro was black. Excuse me. Moses' wife is described as a Midianite and as a Cushite. And I showed you all the pictures. Midianite, Midia is where Sheba is, and it is encompassed in the, in the Cushite people. Right? So again, these people were black people. Also, the Quran mentions the Midianite prophet Shu'ed. He was considered an Arab who was undoubtedly black or brown. The prophet Muhammad وسلم, said he saw Musa and he was tall and Adam, meaning dark brown with curly hair. And Moses was from the children of Israel, which were black or brown. He lived with the family of the Pharaoh and he was indistinguishable from them because he looked just like them and they were black and brown. One of his miracles, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions and describes in the Quran is him putting his hand into his cloak and it coming out white. That wouldn't be a miracle if he was white already. He was a black and brown man. As an Israelite, David alayhi salam and Suleiman alayhi salam were black and brown. Suleiman married the queen of Sheba, who the historian Josephus says was the queen of Ethiopia and Egypt. Other historians also realize that she ruled across the sea, across the Red Sea of Yemen. So because Arabia and Yemen were a part of Africa, she too must have been black or brown. And also, the, and it is no dispute that the sage Lukman was an Ethiopian. 1,500 years before Musa alayhi salam, the Bible says Joseph and Mary, two Israelites, fled to Egypt to hide from King Herod. Wouldn't a white couple with a baby stand out amongst a black population of Egyptians? Clearly they had the same complexion as the people in Egypt, which was black and brown. The prophet said he saw a man with brown, Adam, skin, and his hair went down to his shoulders. If Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, he said, he said it was Jesus or Isa alayhi salam. You know, the same man that they describe as having woolly hair and the skin like bronze. Now these, there are hadith, authentic hadith, which say that he was also white or red. Which one of these will we believe? One of them, at least one of them, has to be incorrect. I'll leave it for you to decide and to decide why someone would say or put this in the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that someone in this region was white. Now on to Cleopatra. On May 10th, in about three days, Netflix will, will premiere a docudrama called Queen Cleopatra. The, C, the series will have an African-American woman named Adele James portray Cleopatra. And this is what she looks like. I'll show you all her face, because I know a lot of you all are not on social media, so you don't realize the hoopla that is uh, happening around this. This is the reason why I had her uh, added to this. Why all the outrage? I, as I have proven, I think, I hope, the original, Ethiopian, the original Egyptians were black. The name of their place is called Land of the Blacks. The Greeks called the place black. And I gave you a 10 references of scholars saying the original inhabitants were black. <clears throat> the country is also in the continent of Africa, 
so it shouldn't be any question about who the original inhabitants are. But there was a creator of a petition on change.org calling for the show to be canceled. Say, and it had over 100,000 people sign saying, take this off Netflix. Social media hashtags and online petitions were followed by an Egyptian lawyer follow, filing a complaint against Netflix to take this off of television. A lawyer named Mahmoud <coughs> Simari filed a complaint with the public prosecutor demanding that he take necessary legal measures and block access to Netflix service in Egypt. He alleges that the series included visual material and content that violates Egypt's media laws and accused Netflix of trying to promote the Afrocentric thinking which included slogans and writings aimed at distorting or erasing the Egyptian identity. There's an Egyptian comedian, a media critic, a doctor, a surgeon. His name is Basim Yusuf. He has been very vocal on social media, on the news, about this depiction of Cleopatra. Not Moses, but Cleopatra. Basim is a Muslim. He has also accused the comedian Kevin Hart and the Afrocentric movement of continuous cultural appropriation and falsification of history. I don't know if you all know this. In February, Kevin Hart had a stand-up, uh, supposed to have a stand-up in Egypt. It was canceled because of backlash over an alleged joke that he gave about the racial composition of, e of Egyptians. Basim Youssef was on Pierce Morgan's show talking about this and talking about Queen Cleopatra, the, the series. He alleges that him and uh, Kevin Hart and the other um, Afrocentrists are saying that their ancestors built the pyramid. This is what he says, quote, I'm sorry, your ancestors had their own wonderful civilization in West Africa. I want you all to remember that he said this, West Africa, right? Yusuf also says the Afrocentric movement was appropriating my culture, calling the people of Egypt of today, despite their skin tone, they call us invaders. That's what he said. We are calling, Afrocentrists are calling them invaders. He said, this is not about black or white. It is about the continuous cultural appropriation and falsification of history that has been done by the so-called Afrocentric movement. He continues, the Afrocentric movement started this, lit, this last century as a way in good intentions, he says, to teach African Americans about their rich history of West Africa, the great empires of Benin, Ghana, um, Sengali, and Mali, right? Again, he's mentioning these places for some reason. Yusuf adds, but the thing is, this is why we find people like Kevin Hart who subscribe to these theories, who claim that his ancestors built the pyramid. This is why he has a problem with them. He says, they call us invaders, and they, meaning the pyramids, are being erased from our history. You good, sister? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm taking glasses off, excuse me. According to a report by on February 27th by allafrica.com, this is what Kevin Hart is alleged to have said. We must teach our children the true history of black Africans when we were kings in Egypt and not just the era of slavery that is cemented by education in America. Do you remember the time we were kings? That's what he said. However, it is not clear when or where he said these statements. But they can't say for sure because I read a bunch of different articles trying to find out where this came from. The first thing is, what's the problem with anything that he said? You say something that's not true? Secondly, African Americans do not take Western Africa as their history. It takes all of Africa as its history which is in distinction to the Egyptian detractors who are only focus on Egypt. The original Egyptians look far more like Kevin Hart 
than Basim Yusuf. So did the African Egyptians that built the pyramids. They are being pretty audacious to be vehemently opposing the Afrocentrics. But they persist. There is more of this. There's a doctor who was a former director general of the Center for Research and Conservation of Antiqu Antiquity. She says Egyptians did not bear the features of sub-Saharan Africans. Hmm. One man's talking about uh, Western Africa. She's talking about sub-Saharan Africa. They are making some clear distinction here. What? Why, why did she say this? Why is she separating Africa in this way? Let me show you all a picture of Africa. This part right here, this orange, is the Sahara Desert. Under here is Sub-Saharan Africa. Over here is lighter people. That's why they're making the distinction. They're saying the lighter people at the top, we're different from the darker skinned people. This is Western Africa where the most, of, most of us came in the transatlantic slave trade. But they continue to say, we are different from you all, and we are the people that built these pyramids. And you're trying to take away our culture, our heritage. <clears throat> the next, the Netflix director says she, she was raised and saw Elizabeth Taylor portraying Cleopatra, and she always thought to herself that it captivated her, but she thought the image wasn't right. Was her skin color actually white? She argues that she knows that she was uh, Greek, but she says Cleopatra was eight generations away from the, her ancestors, making the chance of her being white somewhat unlikely. She also writes that the casting of a black actor was a political act, one that has seen her being the target of online hate campaigns. She says, why shouldn't Cleopatra be a melanated sister? And why do some people need Cleopatra to be white? Her proximity to whiteness seems to give her value, and for some Egyptians, it seems to really matter. Over 100,000 wrote a petition to get this off of Netflix. Adele James, who is the actress, she fired back because she's receiving racist uh, complaints and critics are saying that she shouldn't be uh, play, portraying Cleopatra. She says, if you don't like the casting, then don't watch it. My question to you all is, was there equal outrage when Elizabeth Taylor erased their history? My son here was watching me prepare for this. He said, I want to see what Cleopatra looks like. <laughs> I said, this. <laughs> that's what she, that's who portrayed her, portrayed her in the movie. <clears throat> and here are some people who portray Egyptians and one man who played Moses in these pictures here. I didn't see 100,000 signatures and people complaining about getting these people off of Netflix or off of TV. Let me ask you one question yes, before, you, before you go on. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, do you have any pictures there of the people portrayed in the hieroglyphics? Or the I don't. Or the metal letter? I, I don't, but we can, you definitely can get those. You're right. That would be a, a really a plus because then showing all these pictures is good, right? But also proving the point that you're making would be to show what the Egyptians themselves look like, right? look like, who have painted their own pictures of themselves, of right? Themselves. Well, they already call themselves black, but uh, just to, like you but said, yeah, the picture is worth a thousand. Well, just to fortify mm -hmm. what you're saying, that Absolutely. would be more uh, would be appropriate. Not that these are not appropriate, right? I know what you're saying. You know, absolutely, they, they'll be more impactful. Yeah. I was trying to think of all the pictures that I can see. I'm telling you, I had to go back to Walmart and get some more ink so I can print these out because I wanted to. You should ask me, man. <laughs> I, should, I wanted to uh, hammer down these points. So, um, where am I now? So, where was the outrage? Right. This is a picture, stuck for love, of Moses and the Pharaoh. A movie done nine years ago, right? Nine years ago. Where was everybody upset about this? Where was everybody wanting to get this off of television? <clears throat> Were these people erasing Egyptian culture? And there is a prophet portrayed in this as a European American. <laughs> the actress that played Wonder Woman did receive backlash for her rumored portrayal of Cleopatra. 
They never did the movie because she was Israeli. I'm not sure which is worse, an Israeli Cleopatra or a black one. Somebody's going to cause some outrage, but not the one when they're played by a, a standard European. But here's the truth of the matter. The famous queen crowned Cleopatra VII reigned from 51 to 30 BCE as the last ruler. After her death, Egypt became a Roman colony. The truth is she was not African. She was not Egyptian. So the Egyptians crying about her portrayal and erasing her history is preposterous. She was a Macedonian Greek. The Greeks ruled Egypt before the Romans did. Greeks are white. Egypt was ruled by Romans and Greeks. That is why they look the way they look today. Here is Khalil, what Cleopatra looked like according to a coin during her time. This is her right here, and this is Mark Antony beside her. <clears throat> Her ancestors were Greek. They even married their siblings to make sure they had pure bloodlines. So it is possible that someone with pure Egyptian blood came into the line, but it's highly unlikely. So most likely she was European. The protest, according to one writer, says, join on, my, on these threads from a nationalist yearning to project a unique Egyptian identity to a strand of anti-blackness and a desire to differentiate the Arab world from the sub-Saharan Africa itself is a category that only emerged in the 20th century. Excuse me. Yes, This sir. is a coin of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony? Yes. Which one is Mark Anthony? <laughs> they look alike, don't they? <laughs> Cleopatra is on... Let me know. Yes. I that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They look very much alike. <laughs> uh, let's see. The Egyptian nationalist views, however, are not representative of all Egyptians, with those opposing them pointing out that Egypt is an African country with its own black population and culture, and accusing the nationalists of being motivated by racism and colorism, both of which are prevalent in the Egyptian society. The historical reality is what is what makes Egypt's nationalism and their outrage more intriguing. Cleopatra governed Egypt, yet she was not Egyptian. Rather, she was the last descendant of Greek colonizers. She was a colonizer of Egypt. Nationalists protecting her is nonsensical. She was a foreign occupier who only cared about gaining her own power and maintaining her own power. Who Cleopatra was? Cleopatra. She was also a product of incest. No wonder she looks like that on the phone. <laughs> right. Like many other royal families, members of her dynasty often marry their family members to keep their line pure. More than a dozen of her ancestors tied a knot with cousins and siblings, and it is likely that her own parents were brother and sister. In keeping with this custom, Cleopatra eventually married both of her adolescent brothers, each of which served as her ceremonial spouse and co-regent at the different times during her reign. She also had a hand in the death of three of her siblings. I mean, like, this is somebody that we, I don't necessarily want to be a part of, <laughs> right? Her first sibling husband, she ran, ran her out of Egypt after trying to take sole possession of the throne. And then they had a civil war. She regained and up and regained power and had him killed and drowned into the Nile River. Following that, she remarried her younger brother, but it was revealed that she murdered him also. She also <laughs> engineered the execution of her sister so she could maintain power because she thought her sister was going to take power from her. Furthermore, her claims to histor historical in infamy comes from her seducing two Roman generals, causing one of them to murder the other one. What exactly is there to be proud of, right? One writer who is Egyptian puts it in this way. Modern Egypt is peculiar in that it endured some 2,400 years of nearly uninterrupted colonization. Not only are those years lumped together with the rest of Egyptian history, 
proclaiming 7,000 years of civilization, but none of these occupiers seem to trigger the appropriate feeling of hostility that they deserve. If anything, modern day Egyptians seem to have developed a collective Stockholm Syndrome-esque sense of affinity towards foreigners who occupied and ruled us, because he's an Egyptian, both as ruler and as nations. This affinity shows its face in many Egyptians' pride in white ancestry, whether Ottoman or West European in origin. We might just begin to understand why Egyptians care so much about Greek occupiers being portrayed as black. Now we can consider possibly why some would say that black Jesus, who is described as both dark brown and white, why would there be a discrepancy? Now we have established that the Israelites were black or brown. <clears throat> Wouldn't that mean that their cousins, the Ishmaelites, were also black or brown? Ishmael is the father, father of the modern day Arab people. His father, Abraham salam, was the first Hebrew and father of all Israelites. He is believed to be born in modern day Iraq. Ishmael salam's mother was Hagar and her wife and his wife was Egyptian. Hagar's mother and his wife was Egyptian, which means the four parents of the Arabs are black and brown people. Abraham was surely black and brown, having been a descendant of Noah. Saudi Arabia, as I showed you, is a part of Africa, always has been. <clears throat> now, recently there has been some discussion and books written about the people, the pure Arabs. And I wanted to bring these books here just to give you a, just give you a visual of the books that I was reading to come to this information. And everything that I am stating here are in these, excuse me, in these books. Excuse me. Um, uh, the first one I want to show you is Blackness and Islam written by Imam Daoud Walid. Excellent book, I had a chance to meet him in, uh, for Umrah uh, in December. Excellent, excellent book. It is also, he also has a lot of videos on YouTube and he has another book about um, bringing back uh, manhood amongst Muslims. He is also co-author of this book called Centering Black Narrative. And he has two additions to this book. One of them is about black uh, Muslim nobles among the early pious Muslims. The other one is about uh, the family of the prophet and blackness in Africa. And beyond Bilal, because I'm, I'm telling you, this information, when I was a kid, all I knew was Bilal. All I knew, the only person I thought looked like me was Bilal, right, period. Uh, and I come to realize that this is not the truth. And I wanted to give credit to someone. The first person I saw wrote this, or wrote about this, was Wesley Muhammad in his book, uh, Black Arabia. This information is documentation of the original inhabitants of the land of Arabia, and we've already touched on this. I just want to go a little bit further. As I said, they were included in the Kushite dynasty. Kush means land of the burnt faces. So the people that lived in this place had were described as having black as having as having burnt faces. All right. Ahmed ibn Abi Suleiman says this anyone who says that the prophet was black should be killed. <laughs> the prophet was not black. I just want to give you a some warning before we get into this. <laughs> <laughs> this is somebody said. Mm -hmm. And how long ago was this? How long ago this person said this? This is right after the. Um, it's right around the time of the Moors in uh, Spain. And so a little bit after long, that. How, that is how long after the prophet? Yes. How long after the prophet is the Moors in Spain? <clears throat> Thousand years? Maybe, maybe. So I got. I, I can't give you a, a right yeah, answer. But, but, just, I'm, I'm just a but yes, it's yeah. hundreds of years later. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, how do you say that? I was. He was, he was right there with him, right? <laughs> we don't get to it, brother. We don't get to it. Habib ibn Arabi says it is disbelieved to alter his descriptions and its details. 
the one who does that openly is an unbeliever. He is to ask for repentance. The one who conceals it is a heretic and is killed without being asked for repentance. Wow. Pretty strong words, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems... That means I'm worthy. <laughs> well, he's just fanatical. What'd you say? That dude must be fanatical. He want to kill somebody just because they say they think the prophet was from a different race. Apparently, some so, some people were saying that the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was black. Mm -hmm. So many people, and it was so prevalent, that this brother had to declare a proclamation to execute people for saying it. Right. We would say that now. <laughs> yes. Bad 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 huh? Alright, let me pause for, pause for a moment. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying, I'm one that. We don't to do that now, we good now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we're not good. We'll be alright. We still have to deal with the invaders. Why are you trying to keep me in trouble, man? I'm not trying to get you in trouble. I just try to get you to speak the truth. Because <laughs> remember the truth. That's I'm trying to speak the truth, man. <laughs> where, where are you? I told you this morning. Are you ready for it? <coughs> huh? Born ready for this. All right. Born ready. <coughs> I can't live in cities until you see what I think that yes, you know, when we're using these terms, black and white and mm -hmm. brown, whatever, that um, there's a way that we're thinking about them today that was not the same concept in the time of, of property with property. It was not the same concept. There were no there were no white people, period, in that mm -hmm. whole area. So the, so when they use the term white, it meant someone without blemishes, without, um, you know, skin, uh, what do you call it, problems in their skin or whatever. Absolutely. Kind of pure. Um, and then, and actually the most common terms were uh, Aswad and Ahmad, like um, black and red. So, but black was not the, I don't know, this seems to me that the way we think of black today, we, we put everybody, no matter what, um, tone they have, you know, I'm, people will say I'm black, you know, and um, so the way that people think about it today is not the way that they were describing it and thinking about it at that time, that's all I was Absolutely. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> as I said, the brother said, Anybody call him black will be killed. <laughs> 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 that's what, somebody I'm is holding this into some high regard is what I want to make sure is clear. This brother Ahmed was upset, right? He is in the time when pre-pure Arabs were intermarrying with the <coughs> European converts. <coughs> so let's find out about these pure Arabs. It is now generally accepted that the Neolithic age, 18,000 to 3,000, the uh, year 18,000 to 3,000 BCE, the, I mean BCE, the vast region of West Asia with its extensions up to the Niles and the Indus was occupied by what will be called black a blackish race with its local variations like proto-Mediterranean, Mediterranean, and Hamite. The race is characterized by blackish brown complexion. We can see on a whole a fundamental racial or cultural unity in all this part of the ancient world, which is rightly called the cradle of civilization. This is written by U.P. Upeya in a book called Dravidian and the Negro African. <clears throat> Bertram Thomas in his book, The Arab, says the original inhabitants of Arabia were not the familiar Arabs of our time now, but was a much darker people. The proto-Negroid, proto meaning original, belt of mankind stretched across the ancient world from Africa to Malaya. The belt gave rise to the Hermetic peoples of Africa, to the Dravidian people of India, and to the intermediate dark people inhabiting the Arabian Peninsula. In the course of two big migrations of fair-skinned people came coming from the north, the more virile invaders over to the dark-skinned people. Again, this is a book called The Arabs, written by Bertram Thomas. The original tribes of Arabia, I'm going to write those down that are extinct of these. <coughs> the 
just like, and I, I didn't know this, this is, a, I mean, this, this is some interesting things just when you do a, a bit of research. Excuse me, I didn't know, you know, like they have the 12 tribes of, of, of um, Israel. There are also 12 tribes of the Arab population. It was <clears throat> Ad, the mood, and I know you all have heard these in the, from the Quran. Uh, Tazim, some of these words I've never seen before. Man, Jasmine. <clears throat> We were talking about Jasmine the other day, wasn't we, um, our brother Rabbi? Mm hmm. Abil. This. <coughs> Us. Twelve of those original tribes of Arabia, <clears throat> and they are extinct today, similar to how the children of Israel are. You know, they, you, um, the tribes are scattered around them, <clears throat> pretty much uh, extinct. The first people to speak Arabic were called Arab Al Ariba, the true Arabs, in contrast to the Arab Al Arab Al Musta Riba, the Arabized Arab. Or, for, or foreign immigrants. The children of Ishmael, alayhi salam, are Arab Mustariba because they learn Arabic after they settle in Arabia. The true Arabs were black, according to Ibn Mudar, author of the most authenticated classical Arabic lexicon, Nisan al Arab, said the phrase Aswad al Jilda. Black skin meant Khalis al Arab, the pure Arabs, because the color of most Arabs is dark or al Udma. Al, al Jahzi said the Arabs prided themselves on the black on their black skin. Another author in the book entitled Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire says. To the Kushite race belong the oldest and purest Arab blood. John Baldwin said the original Ethiopians was the original Ethiopia was not in Africa, the original home of the Kushites and Ethiopians. The starting point of their great colonization and civilization moment was in Arabia in his book Historic Nation, Prehistoric Nations. <clears throat> Now, we see in this picture, uh, the picture of Bilal on top of the Kaaba, and you see these people down here. This is why when I was a child, I only thought the only people that looked like me was Bilal. Now, I know there can't be any depiction of the prophet, but we've seen depictions of the prophet still, and they look nothing like me, or you, or any of us. That the great thing about what the sister is saying here is we all consider black or brown and we all have lighter or different shades. <clears throat> but Ethiopia means burnt face. The Greeks spoke of two people of burnt faces. One of them was on the west of the Red Sea and one of them was on the east of the Red Sea. So Ethiopia and Arabia was called people with burnt faces. In the Old Testament, the name Cush belongs not to the Africans, but to the Asiatic, Ethiopia, or Arabia, according to Charles Foster in his book, The Historical Geography of Arabia. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had a dream. He saw black and white sheep following, following him. The white sheep were so numerous that the black ones were almost hard to notice. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu explained the dream. He said, the black ones are the Arabs. The white ones are the non-Arabs who were converts to Islam after the black Arabs. They will be converted in such large numbers that the black ones will be not noticeable anymore. Black Arabs. <laughs> right? I, I did not hear this word growing up as a child. I had no idea. All I saw was a picture of Bilal, and I saw a picture of who? 
uh, seem to be people who look like the Arabs of today. But white Arabs, or non, or white non-Arab converts are Persians, the Byzantine, the Byzantine, which are the Romans, and the Turks. The black contribution of al-Islam or to al-Islam is not restricted to Bilal and to the Africans enslaved. Because even when they were writing the books there, I found out about Sumaya, that she was the first person who was a martyr. You found out she was a slave. You found out all these people who, whenever they're discussing an African or someone who seems to be of the same complexion, as me, you said they find out that that person is a slave. But the black Arab was the main character during this time. The most important tribe in Arabia was the Quraysh. Allah as a wajal named a surah after this tribe. Historian Robert F. Spitzer, you alright? It's frozen on Facebook. Don't worry about it, it'll be all right. Says it is said that the Quraysh explained their short stature and dark skin by the fact that they always carefully adhered to marriage in their own tribe. Al Jahiz, in his book entitled The Boast of Blacks Over Whites, he says the ten loyal the sin, ten lordly sons of Abu Talib, Abu Mutalib, which is the grandfather of Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam, were deep black in complexion. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the great scholar of the tafsir and the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam, was described as very black and tall. Abu Talib and his family were more or less black. All of these are descriptions that I get out of these books explicitly. Uh, the, and he is the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His son, Ali, radiallahu anhu, is described as Shadid al-Udma, intensively dark or jet black. Ali is the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I wonder why this man was so upset about people saying that the Prophet was black. The, the clan, the tribe that he came from was black. Right? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's complexion is described in some places as white or ebony. <clears throat> the Messenger of Allah had, it says the Messenger of Allah had a white complexion which was slightly reddish and had a medium sized body. <clears throat> uh, and then it says in Sunayd al Tirmidhi. Uh, it was narrated by Anis uh, B. Malik, Ibn Malik, that the Prophet's complexion was this. So this is the description of him. The Messenger of Allah was neither tall, such that he could stand out, nor, neither was he short. He was not albino white, nor was he deep black. And again, in the lexicon by Ibn Manzur, the Arabs don't say a man is white, as the sister was saying due to a white complexion. Rather, whiteness with them meant an external appearance that is free from blemishes. When they mean a white complexion, they say red or ahmar. When the Arab says so-and-so is white, they mean they have noble character, not talking about their skin color. When mentioning the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should bear this in mind. <clears throat> and it says, it says, it is when they say so-and-so is red, they mean that they have white skin. And the Arab attributed white skin to slaves. There are multiple narrations that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was brown or asma. One narration says the Messenger of Allah was, again, uh, average height, neither, neither tall nor short, brown in complexion, his hair neither curly nor straight, and when he walked, he had a sway. Adam means brown, so does Asma. In this book, Beyond Bilal, Mustafa Briggs talks about this, and Adam is blackness in human beings. Blackness that supersedes or surpasses brown. Blackness into jet blackness is what this Adam is described as, not whiteness. The prophet says that Moses was intensively brown. When he talks about the narration, that's what it is, it's Ash Asham Adam, intensively brown. Another one says that he is black like the blackness of a crow. And the Arabs of the time were the same. The black skin was of the red skin was very rare amongst the Arabs. The same way it may be amongst people who we call consider very light skinned. 
or a very light-skinned person, and we know why people are light-skinned today, it would be the same reason why they are they were light-skinned then. <clears throat> What's that reason? <laughs> Due to <laughs> slavery and into mixing with races. <laughs> I just want to one to Yes, sir. Like, yes, sir. Yes. My understanding is different, but you know. Is it? You know it's the same, man. <laughs> <laughs> you just want me to say it. <clears throat> <clears throat> and Muhammad would have an issue. He never had an issue being a pure Quraysh. If he had red skin, perhaps they would have said, maybe you're on a pure Arab. They would maybe question his, his authenticity or question his heritage, but that was never one of the cases. They questioned about everything except that, because they were very, very prideful of their skin complexion and distasteful towards light skin. Most of the slaves at that time had white skin, contrary to what we may envision today. <clears throat> another, uh, another writer from the University of Chicago says, Anyone familiar with the Arabic writings in Syria, I Syrian and Iraq and Iranian historians up until the 14th century, 700 years after Muhammad, knows that this is also their depiction of the early pure Arab clan of Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, darker or blacker than black ink, no shred of white on them except their teeth. The irony of history is that early Arab speaking historians and linguists made a distinction between the Arabs in Arabia and the fair-skinned people in the north. And contrary to what we find, in fact, in our time today, those so-called those called Arabs looked down condescendingly on fair-skinned population at the time. Of course, today, due mainly to slavery and conversion of people to the Arab nation, the opposite is thought to be true. So red or, plain, or a, a red or pale-skinned Muhammad would be an anomaly, an oddity in 7th century, century Arabia. He would have had no problem to be proud, a proud, proud black Arab. <clears throat> in Wayne Chandler's book entitled Ebony and Bronze, Race and Ethnicity in Early Arabia and the Islamic World, says all of the chronicles that survived intact agree that Ismail and, and Muhammad were of the black race. A careful examination of history reveals that Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was of the black race and black in complexion. Umar who directed the army to the Byzantine Syria, and the Arabs defeated the Byzantines in Syria, which fell down upon the Muslims' hands. In that same year, the Muslim army conquered Persia. The Persian king fled, and, uh, um, and they were besieged and conquered by the Arabs at that time. It wasn't long before the entire Persian empire was conquered, and the Persian king was robbed and killed. <clears throat> Uthman <coughs> killed, and killed in 644. Uh, Caliph, Caliph um, Umar Anhu was succeeded by Uthman Anhu, a member of the Umayyad clan of the wider Quraysh people. Upon the death of Umar, Ali radiallahu anhu got to the to the throne. This divided the Islamic community into what we have today of the Sunni and Shiite division. With the murder of Ali radiallahu anhu, and <coughs> one of the members of the Umayyad clan established himself as the caliph, and he would go on to establish the Umayyad, Umayyad uh, dynasty. The, um, the Umayyad dynasty was only pure Arabs. And they was the only people that only people that could hold high positions. This led to a great dissatisfaction between the non-Arabs. <coughs> the Umayyad dynasty failed, and uh, I'm gonna write this down because <laughs> I want to make sure this is clear. We were, we were studying this in class also. This was the two to the one. So the Umayyad dynasty. Say only pure Arabs uh, can be leaders. I keep the They always spell that like that with the D. Uh, Umayyad? Yeah. Yes. Uh, only pure Arabs. So of course this would cause some dissension amongst people who are not pure Arabs. They're like, I want to be, I want to be the leader too. Mm -hmm. So when the <coughs> when this dynasty fell. Bastard dynasty took hold. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> and those people that were complaining got a chance to be leaders. So the Umayyad Maya dynasty fell to the Abbasids dynasty, uh, and they ruled, and they were mostly Persians. They had a Persian revolution. And you saw a mass conversion of Persians. So the presence of Persia under the uh, Abbasid dynasty would change the, ethno the ethnicity uh, and theology of Islam. These Persians took on the language, the culture, the religion, the dress of original black Arabs. They became Arabized Persians. And this is how black Arabs under a black prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa transferred into white Arabs. And then a man says, don't say the man is black or you're going to be killed. <coughs> and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa <coughs> last speech, he talks about an Arab is not, he says, we are all under the father of Adam alayhi salam. We are all one. There is no virtue of an Arab over a non-Arab, no virtue of a non-Arab over an Arab, no virtue of a white over a black, and vice versa, except in your righteousness. The prophet said that he came for the black and the red. And the black, again, is mentioned. Uh, the Arabs, the red, are considered people who, were, who had fair skin or white skin. In a book called The Study of History, it says primitive Arabs in the Umayyad dynasty described themselves as swarthy dark skin, and the Persians or the Turkish were rudy people, meaning red skin, or white skin. <clears throat> I'm going to skip a little bit, now he goes in on into the intermarriage served, at, served to submerge the original distinction and cre increase the number of conquered, having adopted the religion and language of the conqueror, took to assuming the identity of Arabs themselves. Now, I wanted to also mention about um, the Hashim, the clan that is uh, part of the tribe of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Hashemites. They were black according to physical description in skin tone and complexion and in hair and hair texture. This is by, uh, this is from, excuse me, Imam Ibn, I mean, Imam Dawood Walid in that book, uh, Blackness and Islam. So blackness and Arabness are seen among the Hishites whose Arabness is not in question. They were insulted, but they were being insulted for their blackness around this time of the um, uh, Abbasid dynasty. And one poet is responding back to them, who is a, of the um, Hishamite tribe. And he says this, he says, you insult the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam due to their blackness, while you, while they are pure Arabs with black complexion. However, you are blue-eyed. The Roman people have embellished your, your faces with their color. The Abbasid Sultan preferred having children with white women other than women with darker skin, eventually this caused the change in complexion. Um, another historian says, because of his, of his dark complexion and Islamic faith, the Moors became in Europe a symbol of guile, hate, and evil. They have this written in Moors in antiquity. Chancellor Williams <clears throat> has a book called the destruction of black civilization. He talks about the Muslim invasion of Egypt. He assumes that these were white Arabs in the year 641, but they were black Arabs. This point needs to be stressed because they were, there were Arab Coptic Christians that saw the black Arabs as liberators from the Roman rulers. W.E.B. Du Bois writes about this. He says the, Arab in, the Arabs invaded African Egypt, taking it from the Eastern Roman Empire and securing as allies the native Negro Egyptians. Another historian writes, these African Copts, meaning the Christians, no doubt saw the African Muslim from Arabia as liberators after all they were kith and king. They saw the Roman Christians as invaders, just like, just like the comedian said, and the African Muslim as liberators. The Muslims, again, did not attempt to convert these 
these Egyptian cups. <clears throat> so, we see here that the Arabs at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was black and he himself was black or brown. So what I want to do is, and I have to do myself, is rethink everything. I was telling a brother the other day that even though I know Jesus is not white, because images are so powerful, that's the reason I printed this, is because that white image still stays in my mind despite the fact I know it's not true. There's images not of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but images of Moses, of Adam, of Joseph, everyone. I, and my son asked me about somebody, I just popped it up, he asked me about Adam. I popped it up and just see what it says Adam looks like. Right? So those things, not only that though, but everything that we think of, all of the prophets in the Bible and in the Quran that are explicitly described, and most of Sahaba looked like us, black and brown. Bilal was not the only one, not at all, not even close. Why did Allah as a wajel do this? There was over 124,000 prophets and over 313 messengers. But he mentions to us the black and brown prophets and messengers. <clears throat> Tell me that Allah as a wajel did not know that we would be enslaved and impoverished and colonized and demoralized mocked and ridiculed in every way in every corner of the world up until today. Everywhere we go we are downtrodden. You see the downtrodden of dark-skinned people all over this planet. Allah gives us these examples of prophets for a reason. To pull us out of the depths of darkness into light and to take everyone else with us. Some may say, why is this important? It doesn't matter what color Adam looked like. It doesn't matter what co color Moses looked like. It doesn't matter what kind of color Abraham looked like, or Jesus looked like, or Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked like. It does not matter. As soon as it comes to light that it looked like us, color does not matter. It mattered when they were white. It mattered when they thought Jewish people were white and the Arabs were white. Muslims love the truth. The truth will set you free. Truth stands out clear from falsehood, even it is, if it is against yourself. The truth is, it is for us to say, the black and brown people of this earth to say that color doesn't matter. We have that privilege now because they look like us. Give us that time and privilege to say, Allah as a wajel sent messengers to every nation. But the ones that we know of, the ones that we name ourselves after look like us. We can and we will be fair and just with this truth. You know, that's what people are afraid of. That once we get in power, they're going to do a, do, we're going to do them like they did us. <laughs> to be clear, I am not saying that black people are better than anyone else. But I am definitely saying that it's quite impossible that we are less than anyone else. God loved us enough to highlight specific prophets who were black and brown. I have always had the question in my mind of why Allah as a wajah continued to send prophets to the children of Israel. Moses or Musa alayhi salam calls them stubborn, stiff-necked people. We brown people are hard-headed people, but we are a God-fearing people. We have had the longest relationship with Allah than anyone else on this earth. So we have had more opportunity to violate his will, but also to redeem ourselves. Now again is the time to redeem ourselves, to get ourselves right with this world and right with Allah as a wajib. Piety, knowledge, and love of Allah, love of our family is our culture. It's our way, it is our tradition. It is tried and true, and Allah as a wajel perfected it. It is al-Islam. So now you have to reprogram your mind to see the people that you read about in a new light. Sometimes that light will shine bright on the black and brown skinned people. Other times it won't. The Egyptians enslaved the children of Israel, both of whom were kissed by the sun. The Arabs invade, invaded and enslaved the Ethiopians, 
Both were kissed by the sun. The black Arab Quraysh tried to kill the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the other Muslims. So I am not promoting superiority, only reality. I dress this way today on purpose. I dress like an Arab, a black Arab. Now let us black people learn this Arabic language because color does not matter. Arab was a description of people who spoke Arabic. That's all. Let us learn the language that Allah Azawajal chose to speak to us in. We will be the Bilal, a caller to the world, and will be like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a mercy to the worlds, inshallah. Any questions? <laughs> yes. 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 Man, I need to learn the Arabic. I need to learn Arabic. Man. But I do have one question concerning the Arabic. Based on what I read about history, Islamic history. Say again, Islamic history. Based on what year mm -hmm. in the Arabic and the Quran, when it was revealed to the Prophet, that the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, um, there were no vows. Right? No vows in the Quran, you mean? Right. Initially, in the yes. In the history, it was first right? revealed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I want to know what you think about the Arabic that was revealed to him. And after he was gone, some men got together and there's supposed to have been a certain amount of them. And they counted one of them as two. From I don't remember all everything, but it, they didn't have enough or whatever. But it's supposed to have been one person they counted as being two persons. And they decided to put the vowels in there. You know, I, I'm wondering, that's why I, that I really want to learn Arabic now, so I can, <coughs> I mean, what difference that make? Does it, it has to change something. So it, would, it wasn't revealed, the revivals wasn't revealed, right? And they compiled this and made these changes after <coughs> he was gone, right? First, the Quran is, means what? What does Al Quran mean? The read. The recitation. recitation. <laughs> I got my Arabic teacher back there. Mm -hmm. So the <clears throat> recitation, it came out spoken, right? When the, when the, when the angel tells him Ikra, he's saying to recite, right? So first of all, it was recited. It's, that's what it is. So that's the main part that you should want to, to learn is how to recite it. When it was, um, I believe it was Uthman, when it was, it was standardized. So what happened is they started converting non-Arab speaking people. But the people who spoke Arab, Arabic in the written text understood what it meant without the vowels. So you all know what this sentence reads? Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, I thought I gave you something simple. He went to bed. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. Oh, oh. I'm thinking about Arabic. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It wasn't a trick question. It was a simple question. He went to bed. What I was trying to show you was that you don't need to know the uh, you don't need to know the vowels. They didn't need to know the vowels uh, in order to understand it. But once it started going out to non-Arabs, they would say he went to bed or he, he or whatever. Any other word? Any other? They would put so vowels in the shit. Take it. They didn't really understand. For sure. They, so really they didn't understand it. it. So in order to make certain that they had the proper, because if you have a wrong vowel, you have a whole different word. It may mean something different. So uh, you have to have each vowel and letter, letter uh, perfectly uh, perfect. So what was happening with the Quran is they had they did written wrote in shorthand because think about them. This is the time when most people are illiterate, and even in it, and the reason that is the case is because they didn't have printers and notebooks and, and uh, computers like we have today. Mm -hmm. So they, everybody had to write stuff by hand. Just imagine writing the entire book by hand, right? So what they was doing was writing in shorthand. They just took the vowels out. So when it went to some people who didn't know Arabic, they were, mis, they were mispronouncing the words when they were trying to do the recitation. So it was standardized with the vowels. In. So it was never an instance, though. Most of the people knew it by recitation because almost all of them, about 95% of them, were illiterate anyway. So they were able to um, proofread the Qur'ans and realize, all oh, of these are wrong. So they, the ones that they, they put down and put into print, they started using vowels and they standardized it and got rid of all of the other ones that didn't have vowels or they had the wrong vowel letter in it. And they actually got rid of the original one. 
the original no well you no. can take the vowels off and if you, if you right. can read it oh so you can take the vowels off and you can read it as far as i remember there are four um copies of the Quran now in uh, different places. I can't remember exactly where they are right now, but they are, um, they're, you're able to go still see those. Excuse me, still see those. But again, the, the, the significance of this though is, and I was trying to tell the sister um, last week, I hope I did a good enough job trying to articulate why learning Arabic is so important. Uh, because the way Arabic is and the trilateral root is some, it helps you to always the, the language that Allah chose made it a language that cannot die. Um, you always, if you know the three letter roots of any word, you have an understanding or a gist of what it means. Uh, and it's unlike uh, most other languages. And it also, um, you also use all of your vocal cords when you are reciting this Quran. In English, I mean, uh, I, I know my teacher right here can attest to this. I still say, Ra instead of raw, <laughs> right? <laughs> because I'm so used to saying words in this English manner, but uh, you have to use your entire vocal cord system in order to say these words. So there's some some uh, vocal uh, <coughs> capacity that you have that you're not using. But also what I wanted to highlight was this is an African language. Another point is that Musa came from Israel, right, to, to Egypt. Then he went, uh, when he ran away, he went to... Um, he went to, to Midian, right? It's on the other side of the Red Sea. He was speaking to uh, Jethro's daughter, and they didn't say there was an interpreter. So apparently, they either they spoke the same language or they had similar languages so they could understand each other, all the way from Israel to Egypt to, to this land in Midian. So this uh, is the sister languages or the uh, Semitic languages all share the same root. And someone asked me the other day, this may be, I don't know if you know the answer to this, which one is... Uh, closest to the original. Do you know the answer to that? I don't know for sure. I've read that people said that Arabic is um, the first language, the original language. It, that it's the original language, but also that it, uh, when when Hebrew speaking people try to find an answer to something, they use the Arabic mm -hmm. um, oh. because it's more closer to the original language. Now, now the other thing is. Um, well, I guess I, hopefully I did a good enough job into explaining to people because the reason that this was so important to me is because I got friends of mine who are not Muslim because they see Islam as a foreign religion. They look, oh, you're trying to be like these Arabs or just like these Arabs. <laughs> like it is an African religion. So why can't we just put on a suit and tie and be it? You can, right, or right. Put on some Nikes or whatever and still. It really, it really <laughs> does not matter. In the same way, really? I can say this doesn't matter, but I wanted to wear it on purpose to say. That I'm dressing like people who look just like me, mm. right? Uh, so uh, my my teacher told me the only language that I knew before uh, learning Arabic was the enslaved colonized language, right. and that's the only language we know. The the bulk, the large majority of us, if we are one percent of the African American population and one percent of the American population, Muslims as a whole, then 99 percent of them are speaking the colonizers' language solely and completely. So that's another reason why we should learn this language. I want to say something about yes. Arabic, and if you remember in the, in the dictionary, the dictionary of the Quran, that when you the Araba or an Ariba, that it means not one just one who speaks Arabic, but it means the ability to express oneself clearly, succinctly, and and that's a description of Arabic. Also, is that it is the most concise language that exists. So it is the ability to express yourself clearly, succinctly, and with the greatest uh, amount of um, embellishment kind of thing that you say one word and it has such big, uh, great meaning. Right. So using that term, again, we have come to understand things in ways that we know them as today, which is not necessarily the real way of understanding them. And to say that someone putting vowels in the Quran therefore changed the Quran, that is not true. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran that we are the ones who revealed it and we are the ones who are protecting it. So it is protected in its original form, cannot be changed. What the vow what the vowelization did putting those marks in me was to help protect it from corruption. 
And even with what we have, there are other versions. You know, the we the Qurans we have in the Arabic are what's called Hafs. There are Marsh, and there's another description of the ones that are from Turkey. And um, but all of those were recited by the prophets. All of those different, and they were verified by the reciters. And that's how the book is the way it is. It was. The book was written and then verified by the oral reciters. And, and it remains that way. There is no change in it. So people who try to tell you that, who try to tell you that, oh, this has been changed because they did this and this and this, it's not true. And, and this is something, you know, you, that's why you have to know the Quran. Allah said, We sent it down with truth, and that's the way it came, and that's the way it has remained. There is no change. By the way, you remind me, I got a copy of the Rosh, um, uh, Rosh Quran for you from before you. I have one. <laughs> uh, yes. Also, uh, we, we were taught by Imam Muhammad that Arabic is an exact science. It, makes, it will make you a scientist in your description of things. Um, it is more descriptive than Latin, which was taken out of circulation. Mm -hmm. um, so, in, in order for us to actually have a good, good description of things, especially that which came before it, we need the Arabic language. We can't just use an interpretation. I mean, sure the interpretations will help, but the more we understand the Arabic language, the better we will be at telling the people what Allah says in the Quran about that which came before this <coughs> book, the revelations that came before this book. Sir, so, so I was telling. That I was. Um, I just. I just want to. I'm, I'm gonna get to you. I was telling uh, someone this is that I was walking down. Uh, I think it was Colonial, and there's an Ethiopian church down there, and I couldn't read the sign. I think it's in uh, uh, what is it? Amharic, but I could see Tawhid, and I knew what Tawhid meant because that's also another Semitic language. Uh, you can see the, the the distinction, and you can see. Uh, what it means and what they're uh, just even in a different uh, language or dialect um, and what you're talking about is in, in terms of making you a scientist it makes you it forces you to read before it forces you to um, think about I'm, just, I'm, to, I'm trying to figure where it was coming before it is it, it uh it does so much to it's more than what i can articulate right now just off the top of my head because um when we, we do a Quranic recitation after Juma, and it's um, it just makes you a smarter person. <laughs> but in the in the simplest forms that I can say, it it increases your intelligence. Uh, it increases your description. Like there, like uh, I think you were saying, there are words that you think like I, I saw Adam meant brown, and then I saw Asma meant, meant brown. It's words uh, that uh, if you change the vowel, you can change the intensity of that word. It's, it's so much that we actually are uh, deficient in just by learning, just by knowing English. Yes. Okay, give me uh, your explanation of what they say he was illiterate. I mean, I know what that means, but I want so you to So this, this, this is an interesting thing because I was, um, so there are two different understandings of this, and I didn't realize that growing up, I understood that he did not know how to read or write. And then I found out that there were Muslims who said that not that he was illiterate, like he didn't know how to read and write, but he didn't have knowledge of scripture. That's it. That's it. Um, so the interesting part, though, is that, uh, and this is, this, so the interesting part of that is that in my Islamic leadership class, they said that he was illiterate. They said he didn't know how to read or write, uh, which is the large percentage of Muslims is agree with. Um, the the idea behind that and the understanding behind that is he had no um, foreknowledge of these things, so how did he know the answers to them? Just think of it in, in terms of, so the, first, if you think of it as the prophet saying, this is true and what you believe is not true. If I do that to you right now, if I say, that's not a black shirt you got on there, or that's not a bow tie you got on there, I'm, I'm already putting you on a defense. You're already thinking of how to get me back, right? <laughs> or what you're going to say in response to me. Now, he is saying, what you believe in is not true. This is the truth. He says, he says, oh, people of the book, Moses, or uh, uh, um, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, was not a Jew or Christian, right? And they were like, where you get this information from? 
right? And then you find out, oh, he says, Jesus was not crucified. What you believe in is conjecture. He definitely was not crucified. Mm -hmm. Just imagine somebody saying that. Listen, I wrote, I wrote a book called Jesus Wasn't Crucified. I was in, um, I was on Waterside at Brown Fest. Everybody, nobody wanted to buy the book, but they want to know, well, what happened to you? Explain to me what happened. <laughs> you know, like, right, you know, right. like it, it makes, it brings uh, people, it, it's provocative is what he's saying. So you have to be on point when you say, you have to know the answer to this. And be, so in order for him to do that, and not have any foreknowledge of it only proves that he was a prophet and messenger. So is that because they don't say the Umi, he was the Umi? I mean. Can I, can I contribute so, to that before you go there? Now, the, the prophet's history, his history also verified that he was not a lit illiterate person. You remember? They, you know, the people used to entrust him with their belongings when they, he would, when they would go on journeys. Also, he married a businesswoman that he conducted business for her. So there had to be some kind of literacy there <laughs> if, if this was not religious. So then illiteracy does not mean you cannot read or write. Understand. That's how we understand it. Illiterate, I mean, does not uh, well, you can read have any meaning. It, it doesn't mean you cannot read or write because based on what I just heard, uh, being able to do some kind of business you had to be yeah. some kind of illiterate, some kind of literate. Right, right. Okay. You had to have some knowledge of... <coughs> so having some knowledge is not the same thing as being able to read and write. So that's the reason why people are on different, on different sides of it. I think we get mixed up with the English translation of what is Omi really means. Right. And, and well, what, what unlettered. Omi really means unlettered. What it meant, to those, people, mm -hmm. what it meant to those people who actually was that. Mm -hmm. Can I? Can I? You have to understand the purpose of that. There are there are things that are closed off to people. When you say he he is Nabi Olumi, meaning that he did not have education and he was not taught to read or write, that didn't mean that he was not wise that he could not conduct business in in a very intelligent way, whatever, whatever. Exactly. But the inability to read and write protected him from being accused of reading other scriptures or writing things with his own hand. He could not do it. And you have a hadith where it says that uh, when the um, letters were written on his behalf, or letters came to him written from other leaders, he had a hadith, or it would matter someone read them for him. And when he wanted to sign, that um, Ali would sign, and then he would, he would um, use his ring, which said uh, uh, Muhammad Rasulullah, he would dip it and then put that on the um, paper, and Ali would show him where to put it. Ali radiallahu anhu, the, the cousin who married his daughter. There's there's a purpose to Allah keeping his that ability of reading and writing away from him. He could never be accused of having read other things or being taught from other books or from writing anything on his phone. The um, the uh, book by Martin Ling. Uh, on the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based on the earliest uh, stories or earliest narrations say that um, uh, that he, was a, that he was, wasn't able to read or write. It's, it talks about uh, the treaty that, you know, on the treaty they had that he was the messenger of Allah and the uh, non-Muslims were protesting against it. So uh, in the, in the uh, biography about it, it says that he says point to where it is and mark that out because he couldn't read or write. So it's it's a it is still a um, up for debate. Some people see it one way, some people see it another way. But according to the uh, mo the majority of Muslims, that's the way they see it. And and the only reason I put this up is just to show that if you change one letter <coughs> in the words, you see, you got jihad on the bottom with an H. You got on the top jihad but two different ages in the middle. And it changes the meaning of the word. Right. See, this H and this H, that's the only difference in this, jihad, jihad. This is your struggle, this is something else. Cal and call. The only difference is here. But look at the difference, one's a dog and one's a hawk. <laughs> right so if you change this character, you got a different meaning. Vowels, yeah, vowels are that important. Very they're, very, important. they're very important. And even more than that, it could be a dot. <laughs> oh, yeah, it could be a dot too, or, or a vowel, or. As Rahim 
Right. Yeah. So that, when you say that, you know, that sparks my, my uh, comparative religion mind when Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle of this law should go away. And they did away with the whole thing. The, the other thing that African Americans, especially because we have been indoctrinated with Christianity, is we can see where Christianity went wrong and why we shouldn't go around along that same path. <clears throat> One of them was making images of Jesus. The other, the other was trying to learn about Jesus using a translation of a translation of what he said. If you want to know what Jesus said, if they want to know what Jesus said in that time, they should have known Aramaic. But once it went transfer into Greek, you lost everything you're trying to say. So that's another reason why we should learn Arabic. One of the reasons why Christianity is the way it is is because they got it from Greeks who believed in multiple gods. And they took the, the, the um, figures of speech literally. And they didn't have anybody to tell them this is what it means. So they took all these things literally that was supposed to be figurative. And that's, that's what we could possibly fall into just by only knowing English and not by knowing Arabic. If you know Arabic, then you can get the dictionary and find out what all the words mean. And it's so wonderful that you said that most of our total thinking came from colonizing. <laughs> right. This is the only chance that we got to say we got something that he ain't got nothing to do with. <laughs> he didn't give us this. Right. <clears throat> we can honestly say he did not give us this if we go and get it. But here's the thing. You got two people right here to give it away for free. At home, glasses yeah. should be full. Hundred oh, dollars. I was here. <laughs> 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 I was here. <laughs> <laughs> I was here. Uh, this, should be, this place should be full. What I, I just told pack. you all, right? I should charge people for this. <laughs> the, the information I gave you all right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is liberating. It is freeing. When you find out everybody in that book looked like you, it can uncolonize what's already happened to us. But they can go around looking at the basketball game. And concerned with whatever they're concerned with. These books weren't free. And they took a bunch of time. Time for my family. I read them and I told you all this because they're important to me. And I think they should be important to everybody. Oh, because did. what you think is not the case. This is the real truth. And a lot of times you, if you can find them, if you can produce a sewer to, to match it, do so. <laughs> right, Someone like we appreciate your time and attention. It's three or nine, not too bad. That doesn't been talking for a long time. I don't do that. Yeah, you left nothing for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> I told you if you wait, I was gonna give it to you. I, you know, I knew you was gonna be in the audience, so I, I was like, okay, I gotta make sure I have this for him, this for him. I didn't know you was gonna be here. If I did, I would have some more stuff. <laughs> She's not getting on me. <laughs> I was reading uh, Arabic words in English. If you was here, I'd have been reading. <laughs> I'd have done great. Yeah, but I was here when you saw my ass. I was tired. I ran through the bridges yesterday, man. I almost killed. I couldn't. 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 I couldn't